Hello. Welcome. I am Judith Panera, Executive Director of AMC and AMC Foundation. Our offices are in New York, and today I am speaking to you from Brooklyn. I would like to begin by acknowledging our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Lenape and Kanarzi peoples, and we pay respect to their communities past and present. We also would like to acknowledge that all our participants and attendees are each on indigenous and native lands and encourage everyone to connect with and research the tribal groups in their area. We give gratitude and respect to all indigenous and native people, their communities, past and present, who share their art and culture with us. Before beginning our keynote conversation, I wish to pause to honor one of our conference benefit co-chairs, Chio Ishikawa. Susan Brotman, Deputy Director of Art and Curator of European Painting and Sculpture at the Seattle Art Museum. Many of you know her, and I hope you all saw her warm and wonderful welcome on Friday. Chio, after an esteemed 30-year career at the museum, announced in February that she is retiring. Chio's ability to evolve and expand with grace, empathy, and generosity knows no bounds. However, she is not one to take the spotlight for herself she is always celebrating, supporting, and advancing collaborators and colleagues. As a curator, museum professional, and volunteer, she exemplifies the best qualities and ethics one could hope for. She is someone I deeply admire. Thank you, Chio, for all you have done and surely will continue to do. I also wish to thank our conference team, Lucy Leiden, Casey Collier, Monica Valenzuela, Lorimar Garcia, and Savannah Welch. They have been just outstanding in pivoting our conference to this virtual program, and I am delighted to have each of them as colleagues. And now to our keynote session. Today, our discussion will be a balance of addressing ongoing issues that existed before the pandemic because they will still be present after, as well as bringing forward topics directly relevant to the current crisis. I do encourage everyone, if you have not already, to read more about our keynote speakers in the catalog. It is an honor to welcome Kaywin Feldman, Director, National Gallery of Art in the US, and Sha Sasha Suda, Director and CEO, National Gallery of Canada. I want to express my sincere gratitude to them for speaking with us. Both the US and Canada are fortunate to have such forward-looking individuals at the helm of their respective national museums, and we all will benefit from having their voices and visions working to change our cultural sector. Thank you both for joining us and hello. Um, and before we start with our first question, I just want um, to alert the audience as we move through our conversation to please put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, we'll be sure to answer them and leave time for them. So thank you again, Kaywin and Sasha, and we'll, we'll jump right in with a, a rather difficult question to be honest. Um, <laughs> in the staggering AAM figure that nearly 30 percent of museums will likely not survive the current crisis and continuing articles from around the globe on looming drastic changes ahead as well as reflecting that seemingly every major crisis that comes our way has a significant negative impact on the arts. I want to ask each of you what are one or two key things that museums need to change in how they work and how they function in their, their model to be more secure from such dire straits in the future? And um, we'll start with Kaywin. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> thank you, Judith. And um, I also want to thank you and your incredible team for all their work and putting this together. You've made um, the work for me and Sasha super easy because of all of your preparation and kindness and um, thank you also for having this conference during this time. I know it's of critical importance to our field. So um, thank you so very much. Um, your question is, of course, a hard one. And I think, you know, in the short term for this, this moment of this crisis, I noticed that um, my um, colleague directors are all trying to navigate sort of getting through the period of closure which has all sorts of uncertainties, and then the period of some kind of reopening, and which has lots more uncertainties, including um, what's going to happen with the economy going forward. And I have great um, confidence and trust in um, leadership uh, 
to be able to come up with some um, solutions that will both preserve the integrity of the institution today, but ensure its longer term sustainability. So I'm going to move, instead of talking about this moment, to sort of the bigger term question about museum sustainability. And I'm not the first one to say this, but I have you know, real concerns about the financial models of um, certainly speaking to uh, American art museums. And so much of it comes out of the mindset of the 20th century, I think. Um, as we were all founded in our local communities, there was one mindset for American museums and it was just all about growth. And throughout my 26 years as a museum director, all I've ever heard um, leadership and boards talk about is how are we going to grow more and um, as we all know we've been on this um, huge march to grow our facilities constantly particularly over the last um, 30 years so we've seen our buildings grow and grow creating the need for um, more capital to fund that infrastructure there's also the rallying cry of more um, acquisitions and collections and don't get me wrong i'm I'm one of those who loves to acquire. So I, I have done my own um, job of it. But um, uh, Glenn Lowry pointed out once that our whole business model is based on growth, but not at all about retraction. And while our um, facilities and collections and assets continue to grow, our funding has not grown at the same rate. And um, I think it's naive to assume that it's going to suddenly start doing so. And so um, I think the sort of big question is thinking about how we manage our growth. Um, just before I left Minneapolis, we were working with um, David Chipperfield Architects to um, sort of revitalize our campus and fix a lot of the things that were wrong with the building there. And I was struck that whenever I would um, talk about the plan to um, donors and trustees, I would start by saying this is all about the visitor experience and fixing the mistakes that were made in the past. It's not about growth. And I would describe the whole process. And then at the end, the um, donor would lean forward across the table, their eyes would light up and they'd say, tell me about the expansion. You know, all anybody wants to hear about is the growth. And I think it's irresponsible. And as we come through this moment, we need to be talking about how we um, stop with the primary goal of growth and instead about um, focusing on a, growing the impact we make in our um, communities and for our audience. Thank you. And Sasha, your thoughts on the well, same question? As Kaywin was talking, I just, I wrote impact, grow impact. And I remember, you know, being uh, on the job market and thinking about leadership and aspiring towards leadership not that long ago and being coached out of talking about how we needed to grow impact and not our facilities. And I think it's something we're gonna to have to start talking about and repeating often because there is a risk in the post COVID world to see growth, expansion and construction as a way to stimulate the economy in a way that museums might dovetail within the larger economic stimulus that we'll need, we'll need to, um, you know, as a society or societies contribute to. So uh, for me, it's the same impact. I mean, how we engage with that um, impact is, is going to vary from institution to institution. I think a lot about digital because we've had a really um, a hard push for funding, um, public funding within the National Gallery of Canada to grow our digital footprint very little of our collection is online. We're feeling um, that lack of presence right now and, and have a lot of pressure to be there at a moment when um, we're really concerned about our, our financial future and trying to invest in it at this last minute is, is very difficult. So the situation has made it clear that that's, that's a front burner issue for us. Um, and really, I think it makes me think about who we are as an institution. I think there's no doubt that everyone in the organization shares the values of, of a generous invitation and of, of inviting new communities in, that that's something we all would like. And as we go through this particularly difficult moment, as Kaywin says, I mean, it is a contraction moment. 
Um, first, because we've closed the doors. So there's key parts of our, of our staffing that aren't at work every day and aren't able to embrace the visitors in the way that they have been day after day, month after month, year after year. And I think we have to kind of figure out how do we, without that in-person experience, um, express that or embrace our communities in that same way and welcome them back, assuming that they will feel safe coming back into our spaces. So it's, it's all a question of, you know, those values about welcome, gratitude, generosity, community. How do you do that when it's not in person? And then when it is in person, how do you do that when there are, there are these real threats to actually uh, expressing and activating those values um, physically in the way that we do. Thank you both. And it dovetails well into the next question. And, you know, we're hearing about all these changes for the future of museums. And one that I think really speaks to concerns around community and making individuals feel welcome and fixing the mistakes of our past, as Kaylin said. Um, when there's talk of reopening, we talk or it's been talked about, um, about limited attendance and use of time tickets, which really raises a concern regarding equitable audience access. Who is going to have access to our audience, our collections, to our museums? Um, and I'm sure that is one of many items that are, that are in the forefront of your mind. How are you thinking through that um, and, and making sure we don't lose that outreach that we have had to our communities and don't fall back on sort of what has been the past of our audience attendance. So your thoughts on how we can, can work to ensure um, an equitable audience access as we reopen? I can um, jump in on that. I think first of all, it's about safety and health and making sure that everyone feels safe coming into the space and COVID-19 really precludes large segments of society from feeling safe in any space, let alone a museum space. So as, as Kaywin mentioned, I mean, we're talking a lot as museum directors about how to create a safe space for, for visitors um, and also how to create a similarly safe space for, for staff who don't just come for an hour or two, but spend a significant percentage of their lives in our buildings. And the idea that certain people who have, um, who are vulnerable within a COVID, uh, within a COVID moment, can't come into those spaces is is really worrisome to me. So there's that piece which you know we can't control um, about time ticketing and limited numbers. I mean, I think uh, until we get into the space, we just won't know what that really means for us. And uh, we talk a little bit about free, free admission here, whether that is going to incentivize people coming or not. Um, but it, it's just a conversation that is, uh, that is we're, I, I'm certainly not quite there yet um, and very worried about it. I, um, I've been obviously spending a lot of time now thinking about um, our reopening. I think like all museums, we're thinking about um, a phased approach, both phased in bringing back staff as well as phased um, with the um, building itself. And, um, you know, as I was um, thinking about coming to the National Gallery, I um, paused and one of my initial concerns was that I have spent my entire career working for community-based museums. And um, I sort of laugh about that um, in Minneapolis, you don't see tourists between about November and May uh, because of the weather. So um, it's, it's, it's just, uh, it was just us up there. And, um, and I hesitate about coming to Washington because um, the National Gallery um, sees so much of its visitation comes from tourists, national and international. And um, one of my sort of uh, advisors said, oh yes, but then the nation becomes your community. What does that mean? I thought that was very exciting. But as I've arrived here at the gallery and spent a lot of time listening to our staff, I noticed there's a really healthy tension between local and um, tourist here. And we're very proud to be the National Gallery and we do wanna serve the nation and beyond. 
and we care about where we live and we are um, local. And so I think that, um, you know, as we um, think about the next um, couple of years um, for the National Gallery, we'll be thinking more about how we work with our local community because we will absolutely be seeing fewer tourists, national and international, um, here at the museum. And, um, and of course, I think one of the top concerns for our staff here is I'm sure in um, uh, certainly New York and other cities uh, dependent on public transportation is the concern of staff members who um, arrive by public transportation. And they might feel confidence that the gallery is doing a great job with our team to disinfect all of the spaces here um, and to continue to do that. But um, it's harder with uh, public transportation. So lots of different issues to navigate there um, in thinking about equity and um, opportunity. Um, but I think for us, it's really about thinking more of, about uh, serving the local community. And one of, um, Sasha, you said the significant amount of lives we spend at work. Um, before the crisis, we sought endlessly to keep work at work and home at home. And two, we were handling this endless circuit of travel and events and fairs and donor development and, and the list can go on and on. When we return um, to what we might call somewhat recognizable in some way, day-to-day -day life, what do you see um, still being deemed necessary and, and how will travel and in-person business dealing shift in the arts? I leave that to both of you. I don't know who wants to jump in first. Well, I'll take that one first. I think first of all, this, um, the understanding that it's going to be a while before we return to anything that's even recognizably normal. And um, I've divided up our thinking about um, strategy into five different phases, starting with the idea of working remotely now and, and gradually going to sort of whatever in the future the new normal is going to be. But there's going to be this um, period between when we sort of start to come back and perhaps reopen and there's a widespread vaccine. And I think that's going to be also a really difficult period as we get used to um, not traveling as much and doing uh, more and more of our business um, as we're doing this conference now and taking advantage of these tools. And of course, you know, um, later on, I, we'll continue to use these tools a lot more. I think that um, it, this has changed um, how we're going to work. Um, but a, um, a real concern I have is thinking about what it's going to be like for our staff and the public as we come back and um, want to be together. And, you know, we do spend so much of our um, life here at work and we could be sitting at home, but we actually like to come to work and it's because we're with other people. Uh, as I did my rounds listening to our um, staff here at the gallery in my first few months, um, the most consistent thing I heard was that people um, love uh, coming to work because of the professionalism and generosity of their colleagues. And so, you know, we crave that companionship. And the idea of being six feet away with a mask, um, it doesn't serve that same sense of companionship. And of course, we won't all be here at once. Um, I also think about our visitors coming into the galleries and we all know that people come to an art museum um, to see a work of art. It's, a, it's about the whole experience of um, that unique work of art. And it's about being with other people going museum visiting is a social experience. It's the people you go with, but also being in a room with people and how strange that's going to be. And um, I, I'm, I'm concerned in thinking about what, what's going to happen um, in that you know, initial period. So I agree with Kaywin that I completely expect a lot of remote work for some time. I think that just being in a, the same space as a number of people, you know, the nature of our office spaces tend to be that, you know, they've, they've accrued furniture and things over time and files and there's, there are often a lot of bodies in a space. So just that, that will be unnerving. And then considering the commute on top of that. So at the National Gallery, we're actually thinking about having um, the public in 
before we think about bringing the workforce in. Of course, there's going to be critical workforce that has to be there to open the building and those conversations are starting now, uh, but we're not thinking wholesale about bringing the office back. I'm really committed to staff making that decision for themselves. Um, it's, it's necessarily complicated and we've started buying uh, personal protective equipment and trying to anticipate what will be required to help staff feel safe. That being said, I think, uh, I think one place we've found solace in the digital world, which is so unsatisfying in so many of its art creating experiences is as a gathering point. So we did tour, we do tours on Saturdays through the galleries and it's in fact been great for the public, but it's where our staff gets together and shares questions and comments on a live Instagram tour. So it, we may find that some of that socialization continues. And, and in fact, I certainly hope that a lot of the cross-institutional and pan-continental conversation continues as well. You know, I don't think I've spoken with Kaywin as many times as in the last seven weeks. I mean, we're in touch regularly, but it's, it's been quite amazing to be able to share obviously thoughts about what's going on right now, but I think it could lead to a lot more sector-wide conversations moving forward. And I th I'm certain that the same is true for, for the curatorial field, for the exhibition field, um, and otherwise. I am a bit worried about, uh, I have to say personally, about the what happens to the work of art in all of this. Uh, on the one hand, I think, Judith, you 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 made a reference to this when you said, well, it won't be accessible to all by nature because it will be so limited. And, and I agreed that some people are not gonna be able to come and enjoy the work of art. But I also think that there's a, I have a fear that there will become this widespread societal kind of feeling that the digital can in fact do a lot more for for society than we might have said it could before, that it's sort of, this could make some feel that this speeds along this idea of a digital supplement for, for what we know is so meaningful in person. And so I think I agree completely with Kaywin that a lot of that happens when we're together and there's this alchemy of working in teams and engaging with the public. And I think as we continue to build our digital footprint uh, just be mindful of how we leave space for the real thing. And, and one could ask, one could say to me, that's kind of a, a irrational fear. On the other hand, you know, if you had asked me eight weeks ago, if this would go on for two months, I wouldn't have said that that's possible. And if, you know, if you talk to our colleagues in performing arts, um, they have really significant and different challenges than we do around gathering people and how that how their art forms will be experienced in person. And I think we should not see ourselves as, as immune to that as well. Yeah, I agree. In returning to the pre sort of world of issues that were relevant before the pandemic and issues that are relevant now and will continue to be, how are you envisioning equity and our art world actually becoming a reality? What do you think needs to change and how do you think we'll do it? I'd love your thoughts thinking big picture, obviously for our arts community and I say plural because it's all um, visual and performing, but also looking deeper at the details such as organizational structures, exhibitions, collections, and, and how, how that's possible. And perhaps also adding to it, um, what the role of the curator needs to be in that conversation in terms of not just the, the art on the walls, but staffing and how they work and how they process. It's a big question, multi-layered, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, can, I can jump in on that and say that uh, I think the AMC has done an amazing job in having these conversations move in this direction already um, with curators who are, its membership is exceptional. Like the panels you had on Friday, I'm sure already demonstrated that kind of this engaging with relevant um, living conversations that push a, a conversation outside of the art world further is, is something that the field's already doing beautifully and, and pushing itself to do uh, often outside of its comfort zone, which is a sign of, 
uh, of its hard work and, and determination to stay uh, essential societal institutions. And so that's happening. I think as a director, what became clear to me as soon as the pandemic hit and you know, the cash flows sort of only started going out and stopped coming in, uh, was that you have necessary conversations about staffing and about um, slowing down discretionary spending. And there are areas within the organization that are more vulnerable than others. And I, I, it's forced me to think about how much museums have shifted over the last two decades towards serving a community, uh, visitor experience, engaging um, with values of generosity and, and um, equity and, and diversity. However, those, those things aren't well captured in our organizational structure. So those um, colleagues of mine who really deliver on some of those values um, aren't well protected within our organizational structure. And that I think will be a, an area of focus for me in years to come to have, um, to have that, that organizational structure reflect a kind of equity throughout the organization. And of course that's about people and equity and fairness and, and uh, but it's also about uh, the risk that it puts the institution in not to be able to have that strength, that bench strength to actually deliver on those things, which I think will be more important now and in the future than they ever have been. So our, um, we closed the uh, National Gallery uh, two days after I finished my first year here um, at the gallery. Um, after my, at the first year, somebody said, oh, congratulations, you made a whole year without a government shutdown. And two days later, I closed down. Um, but um, one of the things we did just before um, shutting down uh, was uh, invite the staff to participate online in the um, input and development of our own um, values here at the National Gallery, which we hadn't defined um, in a formal way before. And 80% um, and of our staff participated. I thought that was fantastic. And um, the number one value that the institution picked as the most important um, consistently was um, looking at d diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, I was thrilled to see that, that it came out of the staff. And so now as we're working on our um, strategic plan and, and plans over the next um, couple of years, that work becomes what does that mean? What does it look like at the National Gallery? And we've certainly had conversations about diversifying our um, collections, exhibitions, and programs. Um, it's a little harder an institution um, that doesn't collect global art. You know, we are focused on old masters from um, Europe and America. Our modern and contemporary collection is more um, global, so there's greater opportunity for um, more diversity. Um, in the modern and contemporary collection, but also more work can be done with the, with the old masters. Um, but of course, it has to start with the staff. And I think the most critical part, as we all recognize, is uh, diversifying our fields. I mean, we can never really um, do the job we should be doing with collections, exhibitions, and programs until we have a staff that is fully um, representative of America. And I... Um, think that leadership in museums um, across um, North America really recognize that um, going forward. Work needs to be done going forward. And taking into account um, the question that, that we just asked and in thinking through a question that's relevant to most of our audience, um, majority of our audience, if you were hiring a curator what question would you ask in that interview that would be weighted the heaviest in the decision-making process for you? It's a tough one. Sasha? It's your turn to go first, but I'm-, I'm Okay, I'll, I'll go. Um, you know, you sort of take it um, that 
the candidate in front of you that you have fully vetted their experience, their credentials, their skill set. You know, that, that's actually not the important part of the interview. The important part of the interview is getting at the person, at their um, values and um, the kind of institutional culture where they want to work at. And, um, and the, the thing I'm constantly looking for in curators is um, sort of twofold. It's creativity and a, and a real interest in the public and um, wanting to know um, what, what the public's interests and questions and um, needs are. And, um, you know, curators have to have those at the forefront of everything they do, just like our educators and our visitor services people, everybody else, because, you know, we're here uh, to serve the public. And um, I think as we've passed through that age of, of blockbusters where um, bringing together world treasures that couldn't be seen before, um, whether it was, you know, the terracotta warriors out of China or um, Catherine the Great out of Russia, um, that huge moment where museums could show the world what they hadn't seen before. And now that um, we've had so many of those exhibitions and um, people are tra were traveling more, um, I think now it's that creative edge, the ability to put together um, surprising exhibitions to um, take um, great works of art and help people to see why they're great and also to tell interesting stories about them. Um, those are some of the qualities that I look for um, from our curatorial team. Ditto and I'd add to that one that really gets me excited in an interview really kind of because I have to say interviewing curators is a lot of fun right it's to interview lots of people and, and that group just you get to learn something and I think I look for that similar desire to learn from colleagues and of course I'm you're looking for expertise you assume that that's there once once you're in the room with the candidate but it's just you know is that curiosity limitless you know are, are they curious about where the institution is situated both geographically and and societally, are they curious about what other curators are doing in departments and about what's happening in the education department or the public learning um, or engagement departments? And is there a curiosity about how they might be able to do the work differently coming to your organization? Uh, because I think we all know that every place you work offers different opportunities. And so for me, it's, it's that, that spark of curiosity and and also curiosity about the audience you know what what is their hunger for there what are they what haven't they experienced before um i like to operate in the space of that those unknowns because i think in that there's real potential for for alchemy between an institution and a and a, and a new curator along those lines sasha i um remember interviewing a um curator of uh, early modern european decorative arts and um, she had spent some time the day before looking at an exhibition of um, contemporary art. And um, at dinner that night, she was practically jumping out of her chair with excitement in talking about this contemporary exhibition. And she had taken tons of photographs on her phone and she kept reaching across and showing to me things that, that really excited her. And I thought, that's somebody that I want to work with who's so excited about art that they can transcend their own discipline and get just as excited in other areas. Yeah, it's, th those are really exciting moments. And I think that's what uh, I think our audience just gloms onto because if you can open that door to all of those, those secrets and some of those secrets are things we don't even know as experts, that's where that point of intersection, that potential really lies. It's, it's a lot of fun. And there's a question from our audience that, you know, speaking of the, the role of the curator, um, and, and I'll summarize the question in a bit, but it's, it's asking how you and, and your teams are strategizing ways to be more plugged into community, community specifically schools, um, providing access, virtual or physical, to students and teachers and groups that have traditionally also been marginalized. Can you offer some words of, and this is the, the 
person that asked the questions words, encouragement or ad admonition to curators for ways of thinking creatively and expansively about our work so that we curators don't continue to operate as we've always done. So, so both positive and negative um, words, I think always think encouragement and um, positive words are, are more valued um, and more important. But can you talk about how we, we can change how we've looked at the work we've been doing? Um, two things. Um, I find that um, because of their um, training, um, and I think the way that so many of them think, that curators um, are um, often really interested in um, data and um, respond very well to um, factual data and evidence and audience surveys that are given to them. They, they dive into it and, and process it. It's one thing. But then the second thing um, uh, doesn't work so well for this particular moment we're in, but quoting um, Brian Stevenson, who always says, we have to get proximate to another person um, to really understand them. And um, I think that's of the greatest importance is to get um, curators out and um, along with the rest of the staff. Um, don't mean to just single out curators, um, but since um, you asked that way, uh, to get out and to really listen to um, audiences, to talk to the public um, in the galleries, people who actually you know, aren't visiting. Um, in Minneapolis, the museum does a lot of um, uh, audience surveys. In fact, for every exhibition, the museum brings together um, a, a panel. And um, I've had the experience several times of sort of sitting behind the, the glass and um, listening into the conversations. And I, I've learned so much from hearing directly from people in the room. One example is, um, I learned that we have to stop with the creative exhibition titles. And I, I learned in these focus sessions that you can't be literal enough, that if you really are aiming for a general um, audience, and uh, I was doing one where we, we had an exhibition coming up that was about um, works uh, by Rembrandt in American collections. And the exhibition title was Rembrandt in America. and in the focus group, people were saying, well, why should I care that Rembrandt came to America? So what? He, you know, came here. And it hit me that um, even Rembrandt in America wasn't literal enough. You know, it should be Rembrandt paintings from American collections, you know. But um, just a little example, but um, it was because uh, um, I took the time always to listen. And I think that's getting proximate. So I, I think about this, the data, right, and the research side, which is such a phenomenally important part of the work that curators do, both for the legacy of the works of art that they're researching in the collection, for the field, um, for the institution, and for the audience. And I think, uh, you know, the key is, is remembering in that research those moments where you got really excited, right, where something that you learned completely changed the way you thought about the topic that you were researching or the artist that you were thinking about. And, uh, you know, I had like a little trick in my recent life as a curator where I would try to, re to recreate or tee up that, that, that experience for the audience in the exhibition as well. So that I didn't just assume that people were following me based on the fact that I had kind of proved to myself while I was doing the research. And, um, and that became a kind of a little bit of a secret weapon because it let people into my experience as a curator and a little bit behind the curtain. Um, and of course, it, it remained as, as, and then you had them, I guess is what I would say. Then you had them with you and you could bring them on this journey, as, as Kaywin says, telling sometimes really complex and nuanced stories, uh, but kind of hooked from this being on the research journey, journey along with you in that question. And, and when I say research, it doesn't, you know, that doesn't have to be as sometimes it's considered within some dialogues, uh, esoteric or uninteresting to a public. In fact, it's just how you frame that question to your audience that brings them along on the ride. And remembering, you know, that you're not entitled to people's attention. Um, I think that that's a key and it maybe sounds a little bit 
dogmatic, but I, I think once I let go of that, if I if I can admit that I felt entitled to the audience's attention at some time in my own career, um, I do now. It's pretty clear that like people have lots of choices, and if they choose to be with you, it's quite an honor and a privilege to have them there, and I'll do whatever it takes to to keep them on that ride with me. Thank you. And another curator-based um, question towards look, thinking of our collections. Um, can you share how you are encouraging curators um, on what to do or how to do around permanent collections as you look to the future, um, given both of your enthusiasm about cross-departmental and cross-field and cross-temporal interests? How do you feel it is best to, um, as well, to present permanent collections going forward? Well, I think we've, it's, we've been really um, an institution that shows a lot of major exhibitions every year, obviously, like everybody. And we've thought highly of our permanent collection. In about two years ago, we reinstalled our Canadian collections to tell uh, parallel or kind of intertwined stories of Canadian and Indigenous art. And I think that this um, moment allows us to reinvest in, in the narratives that we're telling it, you know, as hard as some of the conversations we're having around the exhibition program and how it might be impacted both logistically and financially longer term, we're, we now have permission to be in conversation about how that really significant step we took within the Canadian galleries might actually expand beyond those walls into the rest of the collections um, categories, you know, and so how do we bring, how do we tell a story that um, doesn't exclude any single collecting area from um, a more complex or nuanced narrative? And we've had a, amazing luck within our uh, curatorial team to have um, buy into thinking about those things and diving into that new area in spite of all the anxiety and stress that the staff is experiencing right now. And I'm so excited to see um, what comes out on the other side of all of this uh, from those conversations. I, I would certainly agree with that. And um, uh, here at the gallery, it's been a very long time since we've done a big reinstallation of the, the West Building, the old master collection of the National Gallery. And uh, so the curators and I are, were, before shut down, just starting to have conversations about doing some kind of big reinstallation. I, um, say we're going to take everything out, put it on the lawn, and then put it back in again. And and I said, even if we put it back in again the exact same way, the, just the thought process is the real you know key to what we're doing. And so um, we're having those conversations. Um, I don't think there's any one right way to do it. And I do believe that our visitors want us to help make sense of the world and to organize collections in some ways that make sense to them. Um, in Minneapolis, the approach was to try to do some experimentation. And so there, 70% um, of the galleries were installed in a sort of traditional fashion with Japan and Asia, Japan and China um, in a sort of Asian galleries and then American art somewhere else and African art somewhere else and European elsewhere. Um, but 30% of the space was devoted towards experimental installations just to try some things out and see what might work. And so I think at the National Gallery too, we'll be thinking about a gallery or two where we can try some things out, bring things from across the collection. And, um, you know, probably like most museums, we're looking at um, having to um, reschedule most of the exhibitions that we had scheduled over the next sort of six months. And so that might be a time for us to start some of these experimental installations and um, sort of get visitor feedback and, and see how they're doing. But I'm, I'm super excited about the journey um, with our curators and exploring that. There's another question from our audience, and, and there's quite a few, and I do encourage everyone to continue to put them in the Q&A um, box, sorry, um, is sort of on the flip side. It, it, it's moving away from permanent collections, but thinking about the blockbuster, the large international loan show that um, came when you mentioned earlier too. Um, the question talks about not only has this health crisis heightened awareness of the large carbon footprint um, many of these blockbusters have, 
also the the limit on being able to ship or be able to get um, items back with loans and sort of the varying parts of the lockdown in various parts of the world unlocking. Um, many museums though, and their surrounding communities have over the past decades, looked to blockbusters to boost museum and municipal budgets. And some museums even rely on such exhibitions for a very large percentage of their operating budgets. How do you navigate this? How, 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 what are the thoughts behind sort of the blockbuster going forward? Um, I think the economic sort of attendance part of it is, um, you know, an earlier question um, addressed a bit, but the future of the blockbuster and those international loans, do they have a place in our reopening in our future society? Well, I've, um, I've, in my 26 years as a museum director, I've seen several crises where we've all said, that's it, blockbusters are over. And then two years later, blockbusters are back. So I say this with a, you know, a little bit of um, cynicism, but, um, but I actually do believe that this time is different. And what really makes it so different is that there is so much uncertainty, uncertainty about the disease, about how it reacts, when it's going to go away, is it coming back? When is there a vaccine? What's the economic impact going to be? And what's the societal impact going to be? So with all of those uncertainties that no matter how smart all of us in this conference are, we can't figure out those answers, um, let alone people um, in those specific fields. And so um, I think this period of uncertainty is going to go on for such a longer period. It's not like we come back and reopen May 18th and things are going to um, go back to exactly the way that they were. And, um, you know, like all museums, the National Gallery team has just been doing an incredible job um, trying to reschedule. And I'm so proud of our field. I think we've all been really understanding and generous and trying to accommodate everybody rejuggling um, their schedules. But what's going to be a real challenge is if, as predicted, we have a recurrence um, of the virus in the fall and we have to go back at this all again. I think at that point um, it's going to be very difficult to resurrect these exhibitions. I think our whole schedules are going to be thrown off for a more um, definite period. And um, so whether it's that severe or um, just a longer period of um, COVID recovery, I think we're going to see institutions actually um, trying some new things, being a little more creative with their permanent collections and I do believe that our future is going to hold fewer blockbusters. Um, and the last thing I'll say is um, uh, I remember once uh, looking at the file for this fantastic and important um, Goya self-portrait in the Minneapolis collection. And I think it had been the collection for something like 50 years. And looking at the number of times that painting had been out on loan over 50 years just was you know, really made an impact on me. Now thinking about, you know, the next 100 years, uh, no work of art comes back in better condition than it left. And so, I mean, how much wear and tear can we put on our collections um, traveling at the rate we've been doing um, in perpetuity? So, you know, I dare say that at some point, COVID aside, something's going to have to change. I had a similar, um epiphany, I guess, once traveling with a Bernini sculpture to Rome uh, in one crate and then a 1500 pound Bernini mount in another crate, both shipping them, both being shipped across the ocean and thinking, how can we go on like this as, as, a, as a field? Um, a, you know, I'm sure we could have found a way not to ship that mount, but the way we work together also often requires that kind of that kind of um, compromise and the the footprint we have on on climate is is significant and I think we all have to seriously think about sustainability both of the collection as Kay when you so aptly described the opening of that file but also um, you know on on the world that we live in and we travel a lot and hopefully this allows us to do a little bit less of that and gives us that chance to stock of what's going on with the collections traveling around the world. I will say, 
It's amazing when the clock stopped on March 13th, you know, the Met was a few days ahead of all of us. Uh, I, it just, everything stopped and it made it, it made me realize kind of how complex the exhibition landscape is. And I would say those have been the most difficult conversations from the point of view that there's so many balls in the air and any loan has a kind of domino effect on a number of venues. So we've become really sophisticated in how we budget to make these things work. And if there are stops and starts within the post COVID world for all kinds of reasons, whether it be economic because we, we have to recalibrate because it's so much more expensive to ship things in the short term, or it's because there's a second wave. Um, I don't know that it'll be as, as we'll have to redesign that whole system to work suddenly for all of us, or it'll be again, just the major players playing ball together at the top, which I think we've, we would all agree is not the most interesting um, way forward. I mean, you addressed this a bit earlier in sort of thinking through the responsibility of curators in their day-to-day -day work in contributing to inclusive and accessible museums through exhibitions and through hiring and staffing. But um, another question that has come through is specifically looking at the non-contemporary, non-modern curator and the role they can have in their um, work and whether it's European curators, world masters or Asian art curators or African art curators, the role they can play in this conversation when not just dealing with contemporary art and their responsibility towards that. And, and Sasha, knowing your field as a curator is not contemporary, I thought this might be a really great um, question for you to answer, because you really strove for that in your own um, work before becoming a director. Well, I guess I've just always been so bowled over that things have survived hundreds of years in spite of theoretical <laughs> plagues and, and horrible events in history. And now we're in the middle of one. And what's exceptional about this one in singular and that will be remembered 400 years from now is that we're all experiencing it at the same time around the globe. And that's remarkable. So in a sense, this I think COVID gives us a permission to think about our field globally and across time and place. And um, we, we simply can't do that without thinking back in time. And I've, I've, I've witnessed some really extraordinary conversations happen between curators at the National Gallery of Historical and Contemporary Art um, since I've joined the staff. And in fact, um, they've really kicked into another gear since COVID um, took hold because people are asking like, what the Spanish flu, what happened then, right? And there's somebody on staff who has that expertise and that's early 20th century. But what about the plague in the 1340s in Italy? And um, we're all learning really fast and, and suddenly relying on one another's uh, expertise in, in really refreshing and, and exciting ways. So we have permission not to know everything, which is pretty fantastic. Thank you. And another question from the audience. Historically, some partnerships between large arts institutions and smaller ones, um, particularly ethnic and culturally specific smaller art institutions have really helped pave the way for more diverse programming, such as shared exhibitions and collections. And these seem like they may continue um, to be important and valuable. And how, how so can they do so? And will larger art organizations think about partnerships in this way, particularly as they're struggling to come through um, this as well? Will, will they still be looking to work collaboratively um, in that sector? And also, will, wh what is, is the conversation around more stable organizations helping less stable ones? So really a, a question around collaboration and partnership. I, I, um, I think the answer is absolutely. And, um, you know, bef uh, before the um, crisis uh, hit, we were having conversations in the National Gallery about how we truly serve our national mandate and 
what are some other ways that we might collaborate with our um, colleagues across the country um, with the idea that there's so much that we can learn um, and grow uh, more from working together um, collaboratively. So we were always already having those conversations, uh, but I think there's nothing like a crisis to draw people further together. And um, I have seen even here within our staff um, at the gallery, having talked about wanting to decrease silos and to work more collaboratively across a large institution people have actually been doing it more um, over the last two months. And um, it's been really exciting to see, to see that. And so um, I know we're really um, thinking a lot about how we can be um, better partners across the country and, um, and you know, learn more from our colleagues as well. So I think it's actually only going to increase um, after this. I would, I would echo that. We've, a big part of how we've engaged with our federal mandate is to have an outreach program. And uh, we're looking actually at building that significantly over the next year, year and a half to focus a lot of our energy on that, sort of reverse the proportion of attention we paid to internal programming and push it out to our partners across the, across the nation. And and, and in some conversations with government about how they can support that work. Um, but I think there's more to do. And I, you know, I'm working with the team on what that might look like, you know, as, as a federal institution, I think we've, um, we're, I wouldn't say we're, we're behind, but we're in, it's been a bit of a different conversation about how we work with our community partners because we don't often see them there elsewhere. We might ship a show to another, to another city and, and then um, get a review of how that went or what the numbers might have been. But we're thinking about ways in which, in addition to helping provide program to institutions that are, that are hoping to you know, reopen and to stimulate their programs, there's more to be done there. And, and you know, I think we're at the, really at the tail end of the survival, well, let's hope we're at the tail end of the survival phase of COVID. And when we're reimagining the world post COVID, our world, I think we have to talk to those partners and see what, what this means to them. So I, I'm always a bit reticent for, you know, Ottawa for us, Ottawa is our Washington, right? So that Ottawa kind of comes, descends into a community and says, this is how we can help you. Now it's more about being super, um, you have to do it quickly too because of the situation um, more uh, soliciting kind of more of an open conversation about what they might need all of that by the way when we ourselves are in, in uh, kind of in in difficult situations as well so uh, that's the name of the game is trying to, to figure to walk that tightrope thank you and thinking of the the future and that long term, um, might you both share with us some of your longer term visions and also address the question from the audience around as we are dealing with budgets being slashed and, and the realities that come along with that, how are we longer term vision thinking of addressing that equitable in terms of salary and making the arts a, a viable industry to work in if you are not from a privileged background? There's several questions in there. There are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I guess one thing I would say is that the fantastic thing that's happened for our sector and I would say culture writ large in the context of this pandemic is that People need us. I mean, that gives me incredible optimism about the future is that people are visiting our websites and they're tuning into our tours and they're engaging in our webinars and um, they're looking at our works of art and that is a, an incredible thing. And it gives us a, a platform maybe that we didn't have before on the, on the stage that I'm in, for example, within the federal government. So telling that story of what our impact already is and what it could be is critical. And that's what I'm thinking about right now. 
and then working with the team on articulating a narrative by which we can deliver that more relevant, urgent, timely kind of program, whether it be actual program or just, um, just the building of the collection and all of that stuff is what's going to come next. Uh, I, I certainly had a, <laughs> I have a vision for the museum from three, from two months ago, three months ago, <laughs> words, but you know, this, this in some ways like speeds it up in an exhilarating way because it does, you know, it does some of that work for us. You know, fewer people can ask us whether it's really necessary to be relevant and whether there are other communities that you're not engaging with or, and I think that's become pretty clear in this moment to me. Uh, I think longer term at the gallery, um, as I said from um, my, my first comment that we're thinking a lot about impact and how can we deepen the impact that we have and what kind of impact do we want to have uh, together uh, on people and, and what's that impact locally, nationally and, and uh, internationally. Um, we want to both reflect and attract the nation and um, we want to um, have storytelling and curiosity be at the center of what we do. And I think that uh, due to this moment, the whole idea of sustainability uh, actually has increased in its importance um, for us in our, our longer term thinking. And I mean sustainability in all ways. I mean um, financial sustainability, audience sustainability, as well as, of course, um, environmental sustainability. Um, so lots to think about there that perhaps wouldn't have been quite as strong uh, pre-COVID. I should just add also, I think it's an extraordinary moment to give living artists a platform as well. Um, I think that for our, within our collecting mandate, contemporary plays a big role and there's an amazing moment here to give artists sort of a platform to, to share their thinking, whether it's related to what's going on right now or not. I think that these are the voices that we have the power to uh, unlock for the society right now. Mm -hmm. And Karen, you mentioned um, impact. And one of the questions actually um, is addressing that and how we can convince directors and board members and other leadership and as well as our own teams and funders, um, how we can prioritize impact. And have you found any metrics that are successful in sort of measuring that impact? Yeah, I mean, impact is hard and in part because we can't follow people around. Um, I, early in my career, was pitching funding for an education program um, when I was in Mem Memphis for fourth grade students. And um, the um, head of the foundation said to me, well, how do you know the long-term impact of that program? And um, his foundation advisor was sitting at the, at the table and she said, Oh, my son Lewis did it and when he was in fourth grade and um, he's an artist today as an adult because he had that program. And of course my head whipped around. I never would have known that story if we hadn't all been sitting at that table. It's hard to follow kids around. Um, so uh, it's hard but not impossible. And um, there, uh, I find myself looking a lot at some of the uh, testing mechanisms that um, uh, social scientists use in um, psychology, for example, um, to, to measure um, the change of attitudes. And um, in Minneapolis, we were working on the change in empathy. So there actually are more ways than we normally think of as our historians to, to measure impact. But I think it's, if you start with that as your goal and think about how can we have the greatest um, impact, because I find um, also, as I was saying at the beginning, that um, I often think of our um, uh, growth over the last, um, really the, the last century as being like a logic model that um, foundations always like us to use, where you start in a logic model with what are your um, inputs, and those are your, um, your uh, financial resources, your collections, uh, your staff, um, and they create outputs, and those are the exhibitions and the programs and all the things that we do. And we're so used to talking in that output realm that we've had this number of exhibitions and so many people came through our galleries. 
And really, we need to be moving farther along the logic models. What are the outcomes and the impacts? So how did we make a difference um, to people and how do we make a difference to society? Much harder, but not impossible. And actually, kind of ironically, where our where museums started was to make impact. You know, they were founded to make impact, to educate. It was problematic, that's for sure. But it started there and we were comfortable talking about it in that way. And now I would say, I mean, you have to start with a board that has goodwill and wants to, to see change within the museum sector. I am always weary about... Sorry, I have a dog. Phil, his name My is dog. Phil. Um, I'm always... Just, just one sec. Phil, come here, come. I'm, I'm always weary of kind of data around how the impact that the work we have makes because it's at its core creative work, right? So how do you, how do you measure the impact that a painting has on somebody that's looking at it? That's really hard to do, right? And then why should there then be more data for somebody's experience in viewing the paintings in the way that you've arranged them or it, with the story that you've told next to them? I think a key is just embracing risk in our field and doing things differently and it doesn't have to be drastically differently. We're not, we don't have to become, you know, a uh, movie theater or uh, not that that you would want to be one of those right now, but you know, you get the sense of what I'm saying is at a certain point, we have to embrace the creative mandate that we have and, and just build goodwill with our board members and bring people who want to support the cause. And that's going to get us where we want to go. Thank you. And before we end, I'd, I'd like to ask each of you, because um, I'm curious as well, is there a leader in keeping in mind what doesn't necessarily need to be in a leadership role um, to lead? Who are you admiring right now? And, and, and what are they doing that has really inspired you? You know, who's rocking my world right now is the Prime Minister of New Zealand. She is incredible. And, um, and she's been incredible for a while. So uh, you might recall that after the um, horrific mass shooting um, in New Zealand, within a week, she had changed the laws um, so that um, they were banning assault weapons. I mean, that kind of immediate action um, there on behalf of her people. And um, following her now, there's a great article in the Atlantic magazine about her leadership. And, um, and I have to point out, you know, um, that uh, you haven't asked us, Judith, about the fact that we're both women leading the, um, na our national museums, but um, you can't help but read this article about her and think about a female model of leadership because she makes the point that she's an empathic and um, thoughtful and um, sensitive leader and she's tough and that those don't have to be um, at other um, extremes. And I love the stories of her um, being honest and talking about what's difficult, um, what uh, the uh, crisis that New Zealand would go through, but main, remaining optimistic about the future. Um, the stories of her delivering addresses to the nation in her sweats with a, a children's toy behind her. Um, she's a very authentic leader and I think um, has proven um, incredibly successful uh, at this time, especially looking at um, the reduction of um, cases uh, in COVID uh, in New Zealand. I'm a fan. Great, I'm a fan too. She's kind of a rock star. And Sasha, I have to. I have to say, I would echo Kaywin because it's. You know, I'm in my. Well, I marked my first year uh, at the gallery about uh, <laughs> two weeks ago. Which, you know, just so you all know, when I started, Kaywin said to me, your first year is just going to be really hard. Like it, it, might, it might feel awful, you know, and, and I thought it was pretty tough, to be honest. And then when, when COVID hit, I sent her a text and I said, did you see this one coming or, um, <laughs> or was it based on what happened before? And so I've been looking, you know, this is unprecedented for me. I don't have the benefit of having been uh, through a previous really... Um, crisis and I've been looking to anyone who can give me permission to be myself uh, and 
you know, we are fewer in number women around the table running large institutions with big budgets. And uh, there, there is uh, something in seeing a woman who's also my age uh, taking difficult positions and understanding the challenges that she might, must be facing behind the scenes um, is, is very, very, very inspiring for me personally. Thank you. And yes, we had many more questions from the audience. We had questions we had talked about um, addressing in your conversation before the crisis. And of course, highlighting that, you know, you both are rather new to your positions um, and that honeymoon period ended rather abruptly <laughs> with the current crisis, but that you are both individuals identifying as women leading national institutions, and that is sadly rare in our um, society. And so I, I definitely admire both of you for taking on the roles you have and for making um, time for this conversation and for being honest and candid with our audience um, throughout our conversation. Um, this is the end of our, our discussion. We've come to our time. And again, I thank you both. I thank our AMC team again and to all our attendees for creating a really engaging and exciting conversation today. Um, as we sign off for a small bit, um, our next session will start very soon. I hope our audience will stay along. And again, thank you both. You're, you're wonderful and I wish you um, stay well and stay healthy and stay in touch. Thank you. Be courageous, everyone. Yeah, be brave. We'll get through it together. <laughs>